Good morning, YouTube. Today, I bring you a treat from the age of segregated water fountains, McCarthyism, and the greatest American car ever made. I don't have one, but uh, pretend this is a 58 Eldorado. It's got big fins and lots of chrome. It's basically a Cadillac. I present this, sent to me by a Patreon member, ostensibly as a content idea, but I suspect he was cleaning out P. Paul's garage and found some junk that was too sentimental to throw away, but not sentimental enough to keep, and much like the neighborhood cat lady, he knew I'd take it in, throw it to the pile, rather than throw it away. Anyway, it also came with this Cummins drill, which really tickled my fancy, until I learned that this tool company has nothing to do with Clessy Lyle Cummins and his fabulous diesel engines. It's just another generic American tool company from yesteryear, that sold heavy Jacobs Chuck equipped power tools that outlived both you, your children, and their own relevance before inevitably being sold out to the Chinese or disappearing altogether. There's no date on the box. I'd Google the patent number, but that is still pending. But you can tell it's from the 50s based on the name. Versamatic. Fits right in with all the other transmission names of the day. Torque Flight, Dynaflow, Power Glide, Hydromatic. Versamatic. You see, marketing professionals in the 50s were all doped up to their eyeballs on amphetamines, and therefore, so yeah, introducing the Versamatic Drill Speed Reducer and Reverser. It's an auxiliary transmission for your Pop Pop's old single speed power drill, and it's a genius mechanical solution to three major weaknesses found in all those early electric drills. No dual speed. You can't reverse them. They don't actually stop when you let go. Nothing like running a screw in way faster than you wanted to. Rounding it out or splitting the 2x4 because your drill has more rotational inertia than God and someone forgot to install electric brakes. And now your screw is sunk and you have to get it out manually because this beast has no reverse. It's 1955, and this sort of communist witchcraft hasn't even been contemplated yet. So what do you do? Versamatic to the rescue! It solves all the shortcomings of the contemporary power drill. It's not without its quirks, though. Looks a little bit like a Yankee bit. Firstly, if you combine the length of the drill, the Versamatic, and the bit, it's longer than my arm. Granted, I have the arms of a 12-year-old Norwegian girl, but still, there's a reason all the Greco-Roman statues have teeny tiny wangs. Practically speaking, a big one is clumsy and disadvantageous, except in one esoteric application that I wouldn't know anything about. Other than that, it just gets in the way when you're sword fighting a lion in the Colosseum or naked wrestling a sweaty Macedonian. Mm. It could probably be made more compact, but it's got to fit in your meaty claws without a lot of fumbling around. So, its girth is necessary, and that's why I call it a quirk, and not a flaw. Second quirk, some misleading advertising. Despite what this says, usable torque does not increase seven times. How is that possible? Because meat friction is the only thing keeping this transmission in gear. You gotta grasp the front half, firmly, and this Cummins drill has as much starting torque as a Cummins engine, and that's before you gear it down seven times. This will turn the palms of your hand into scrapple before you achieve anywhere near full torque. But much like the bulkiness, this is also kind of a feature, because you have to keep this half stationary to keep it in gear, so dropping it into neutral is as simple as... Firmly grasp it! The drill keeps turning with no brakes, but if you time it right, which should be easy because it's spinning seven times slower, you can stop the bit instantly and with the timely precision of a modern drill. To throw it into reverse, you gotta unscrew this knurled nut and then 
All you gotta do is hold the rear half still. And then... I have no idea how this works, but it's awesome. Sure, it's not as simple and fast as... But hey, it's the 50s, you filthy beatnik. These were pretty expensive back in the 50s. 10 bucks, which is equivalent to 100 bucks in 2019, or 1,200 bucks in 2025. In addition to slotted Phillips and quarter-inch bits, you get this little rod, which allows you to crack the reversing mechanism loose, which is a problem because the reversing mechanism gets stuck tighter than the knurled collar, and then it starts slipping just like every Ford I've ever owned. I imagine punching that roll pin out proud, just a hair, would keep the aluminum knurled collar nice and tight. Let's scratch the tism and take it apart, because why not? It's got three screws, all slotted, my absolute favorite kind of screw. They never strip out, and they're super easy to use with power tools. Robertson screws are actually my favorite, but don't tell the Canadians. I don't want to give those Canucks the satisfaction. To the surprise of absolutely nobody who's seen the inside of an automotive transmission, it's got a planetary gear set. The hardened sun gear is centered in a cast aluminum housing with three bronze bushings for each planet gear. Each planet has a brass washer, helps take up axial play. The ring gear is pressed in, which is unfortunate because I only have a four-year degree, and in order to understand how things work without seeing it, you either need a master's degree or common sense. I possess none of the former and very little of the latter. Might just be stupid enough to work. Well, it was stupid enough. Onward! Off comes the ring gear, and here is the magic. The carrier is two pieces. This ingeniously designed piece screws clockwise onto the bit shaft. When it's all connected, and those three slotted screws are going through the rear housing and the planet gears and the carrier, torque gets multiplied and transferred directly to the shaft. When you unscrew the knurled nut, you're unscrewing the bit shaft from the carrier, which, by the way, has one starting thread, two starting threads, three starting threads. Same thing on the male end. I didn't know screws with multiple starting threads were a thing, but it makes it easier to get started, and if they made light bulbs like that, my wife might actually be able to replace one without calling me in from the garage. So, with the screws installed, and pretend the male end of the bit shaft there is engaged with the carrier, the carrier will spin freely unless I hold the ring gear normally one with the front housing, in which case it spins with seven to one gear reduction. With the knurled knob unscrewed from the carrier, the carrier is completely removed from the torque path, and all the torque goes from the sun gear to the ring gear pressed into the front housing via the planet gears. See how the ring gear spins backwards? This relies solely on the friction fit of the ring gear inside the front housing, so I'd like to see some splines or something to keep it from slipping, but eh, what the hell do I know? This is wheel bearing grease. I don't know the difference between wheel bearing grease and axle grease and general purpose grease. Other than the taste and color, I assume temperature response? In this application, I think one is as good as the next.
come on, start. I'm gonna go apologize to my wife now. I adore machines that performed functions we now use electronics for. I love antique clocks and watches. I even love carburetors and points ignitions, as a concept anyway. And I love this thing. It's too cool to throw out, but too obsolete to use. It's a very complicated solution to a very simple problem. Why deal with all this extra weight, protruding mass, and general fiddliness when you could just simply be born after the popularization of the transistor? That's what I did. to work on my grip strength maybe later tonight for now i'm in a 50s mood so i'm gonna go for a cruise in the cadillac we have at home you're welcome to join me but if not thanks for watching